Hi, and welcome to Stories of Climate Change Hope, the podcast that brings you a little bit of hope every other week. My name is Steffen Schwartmann, and today we listen to the climate story of Teresa Landwehr and Kun Woro. They are both students in the master's program Global Change Ecology at the University of Bayreuth in Germany. And today it's all about the forest because Teresa and Kun developed a project that aims at planting trees locally as fast as possible. Hi Teresa, hi Kun, how are you doing? Hi hey, Stefan, nice to meet you. I'm fine. Yeah, hey Stefan, I'm doing all right. And we are connected over continents, I think. Teresa, where are you? <laughs> I'm in Germany at the moment, in my old hometown, at my parents' place in Lower Saxony. And what about you, Kun? I'm now in South Korea, a city named Sejong. Uh, this, uh, this city is actually a, let's say, second capital of South Korea, uh, which was newly developed to serve as a administrative center for South Korea. And now I'm here because my partner is working uh, at an institute uh, that is based in this city. And it's uh, uh, at the very center of South Korea. Oh, so it's very far from Seoul. Well, uh, if you take... KTX, which is an equivalent version of ITE of Germany, it only takes, let's say, one hour because uh, South Korea is quite a small country. Yeah, maybe one detail I, I need to add. I didn't mention this, but I'm also, I also joined the Klimawald project um, a little mm -hmm. bit later. So mm -hmm. maybe I can also join, but it's a focus on you. I want to know more about you and tell the listener what, what the project is all about. Mm -hmm. So the first question, very basic. What is Klimawald? No, it's your turn. <laughs> Who do you want to answer? <laughs> I mean, you had the initial idea, so... Klimawald means climate worst in English, uh, which basically uh, explains everything. So we wanted to build a patch of forest which can adapt to a changing climate. That's a brief description, I would say. <laughs> yeah, so perhaps to add on that, um, I don't know, do we want to talk about the yeah, development of the project as well, because I think at the beginning, actually, the focus was more, more on um, yeah, climate mitigation. And mm -hmm. somehow during the entire process, it mm -hmm. um, yeah, developed or the focus was more on climate adaptation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did this change? Yeah, so yeah. But I think it's, Kundu, you want to say something about that? Well, basically, because forests, uh, I mean, talking about climate change, uh, it's not only like mitigation or uh, adaptation when we do something on forest, because uh, trees serve as, uh, I mean, forests serve as carbon sink. And, and in that regard, it, uh, related to the climate mitigation, but at the same time, because they are organisms and they are affected by the temperature and precipitation, for example. So we have to uh, look at the adaptation part in this climate change discussion when we do something on forest because not every species can 
adapt to the changing climate, as you might already know from the state of the German forest, where spruce and pines are uh, wilting and and dying and turning into brown uh, dead dead wood rapidly recently. So how how did you decide or like what tree species did you plant then? I mean, is it possible to know what tree species will be more adapted to the climate in the future? So um, maybe my uh, explanation needs uh, more elaboration. Uh, so basically, at first, we had this naive idea uh, to plant some trees because our carbon footprint is so huge. But uh, as we de developed our project, we realized that even a hectare of forest can reduce only so much uh, from our carbon footprint. So it doesn't really make sense to only focus on climate mitigation. So we then uh, started to think about the adaptation part and, and from your question, uh, I mean, related to your question, uh, luckily we had this uh, forest expertise in at the University of Bayreuth, whose name is Dr. Greg Was. And because he's uh, quite a, uh, how can I say, he's an expert in, in forestry and forest ecology. So he already knew and he was researching those species which can potentially adapt to the changing climate, which he's not 100% sure, but he had more clues than the others. So uh, I went to his office and I was asking a bunch of questions and uh, look, uh, gladly he agreed uh, on uh, my suggestion, which was how about to have a portfolio of various species uh, rather than having only a few species, which is actually what people usually do when they plant trees they usually pick just a few species to make it simple i still remember the day when we went to gregor as office you too kun mm -hmm. it was super relaxed um yeah we basically went there and knocked at his door and talked about our idea and then we talked about the species selection and I still remember how positive and optimistic he was and he just said like yes um, that's a nice idea and yeah we should talk about um, the species selection there are several options and yeah let's have a meeting and go to the forest side and see about the local conditions mm -hmm. and It was really nice that he gave such a positive feedback directly at the beginning of the project because I think it motivated us and we just started directly. So we didn't think about the entire pro project set up super long, but we just started somehow. So yeah, I still remember the meeting um, mm -hmm. and yeah, it was really nice, I think. Yeah, I think I, I never heard that story. That you, yeah, about the first meeting, but now how you describe it, I can, I can imagine it, <laughs> and I know that, yeah, Gregor Ars is a super nice guy, and I, I can imagine how, how even mm -hmm. more motivated you were after the meeting, <laughs> you know, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm also interested when I invite people to the podcast. Sometimes I also ask with relation to their study program, you know, because some listeners, maybe they are still thinking of what to study or what to do as a master degree. And then I ask, I also want to ask you, like, how, what would you say, like, did your study program somehow prepare you to develop this project? Or how, did it help? Did it help you? I can start perhaps if that's fine for you, Kun. Yes, yes, please. So my spontaneous answer on this question would be yes. Um, the study program 
Global Change Ecology really helped me setting up the project because it provides a lot of flexibility in the entire study program. And of course, we also have super motivated and supportive students and also study program coordinators who yeah, really try to help and support us as much as possible. So I think, yes, the study program really helped us also due to or with regards to yeah, working together and in a team aiming for a common goal. And also, yeah, the interdisciplinarity, which is also a huge part or yeah, part of our study program um, because it's an international and interdisciplinary study program. And I think this aspect also helped during the entire project um, process when we talked with our stakeholders, for example, because we have stakeholders from forestry, from science, from the public, of course. So I think that was also something that was helpful. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, and uh, maybe I can be more specific. I think it was so lucky uh, that there was this course called uh, Project Management when I was thinking about this project. So at the very beginning, I, I had this idea just for myself. I, I was going to do it anyway. And then I found out this course, which was under the uh, schedule of GCE program. And then I was like, okay, because I don't have any experience uh, developing a project, uh, this course might help. And I just sent an email to Dr. Birgit Thies uh, telling that I have this idea to plant some trees with, with my fellow students and it would be really nice to be able to learn something from you because she, as a, as a director of this uh, interdisciplinary research platform uh, at the University of Bayreuth by CEO, she already had m many, many, many experiences uh, with different projects. And yeah, it turns out that it was really helpful and I was able to meet uh, not only Teresa, but actually before Teresa, I met Nikunj Patak from India. And yeah, with this uh, unexpected, let's say, interactions and, and, and the interest from Nikunj and Teresa, this project came into reality. So I, I, I think uh, not only the GC program, but the fact that uh, there were so many uh, students from different part of the world who were studying under the umbrella of BICEO really helped me, help us to develop this project. Yeah, it's really great that you you found so much support even in the in the beginning. And I think it's not yeah, like I wouldn't even say that you were just lucky. I think you know you really convinced people to to join the project and I guess it's also about about you like how you tell people about the project that they think Oh yeah, these two or these three, I think they they could really pull it off. We could do it together. Not sure if they uh, thought in that way <laughs> at the very beginning. Yeah. Well, it worked out, you know, <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 In this initial stage, when you when you two thought about the project or you developed the project, did you immediately see? Maybe it's difficult to say, but did you see that maybe there were some skills that you needed to improve or were you all set up and you thought like, okay, 
I know what to do. I know how to do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Actually, I think it was a lot of learning by doing because the entire project developed at the same time as the course project management was happening. So it was not the case that we had this course project management and then we developed our project, but it happened at the same time. Um, so it was really a lot of learning by doing. Um, yeah, and um, I don't know, perhaps Kun, you want to add something, but um, what what I like, it, or what Kun told me and Nikunsch told me, like, um, because setting up a project in Germany sometimes requires the German language. So I think there was one skill that we needed, <laughs> and that was my main part in the project team, I think, um, because from like the student core team, let's say, so at the beginning it was Kuhn, Nikunsch and me, I was the only German speaking person. Um, so perhaps that was my skill. <laughs> yeah, truly. And I don't know what to add. Yeah. So German language, that was uh, our weakest, weakest part. And I was so glad to have Teresa. And I, I vividly remember when Birgit asked around uh, to the students who were in the project management course, um, like if there was anyone who is interested in joining in our project and Teresa was I think uh, <laughs> hesitating just for a few seconds and raised her hand faster yeah. than the other <laughs> Teresa as far as I, I remember and I think that was um, there was such a crucial moment for our project yeah I think it's really yeah but other than that I see so true we were do uh, learning by doing it mm -hmm. Perhaps if you ask others about our skills, like for example, Birgit Thies from the Bicier, I think she would say, yes, we have skills. <laughs> but yeah, Kun and me, we are a bit hesitant. But yeah, as we said, it was a lot of learning by doing, but I think not everyone would have been able to really set up the project. It was really a very good combination, I think, out of different or our, our per different personalities. and. Um, yeah, I think we were super motivated and that really helped us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you had the, the project idea. Yeah, learning by doing. That's really also great to, I think, tell others. Because if, if you think about developing your own project, it's always like, oh, I have such a great idea, but where to even start? And when you say it's learning by doing, you know, just start. I think that that can be very motivating, like just reach reach out to someone like a friend and then someone who could support you in the project and then basically start and you will figure it out. That's a very, very strong and helpful statement, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think like if you would have asked me or Kuhn like two years ago, um, yeah, I think we wouldn't, we would not have believed that we are able to set up a project um, in this scale or like that we are able to realize it also in such a quick time or period of time. And like it got bigger and bigger. And yeah, I think it's really nice to experience that, that every, everyone could actually just start setting up a project as long as you are motivated and you find supportive and cooperating people around you, you could just start. So you don't need to have, I don't know, plenty of skills, but you can always learn by doing. And yeah, I think that was one of my biggest learning learnings from the entire project. So not just learning, 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 and then start somewhere but just start <laughs> yeah this is so great <laughs> and and developing this having developed this project and having seen how how successful it was did 
this also influence you, for example, in expectations you have or things like believing in yourself, having maybe different goals than before or thinking, oh my God, I did this project. Like now I can do much more. Was there something like, like this for you? Uh, maybe I can start. Mm -hmm. I was not actually thinking too much uh, on myself uh, after after we got some attention from 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 university and media and the fellow students who were being really nice and uh, giving us good comments and feedbacks. I was actually looking at the the uh, short shortcomings. Mm -hmm. Is that yes. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the limitations that we we found from our project. Uh, and I was at the same time thinking about uh, the climate action that we are so des uh, desperate to to make, and even though I was looking at this these uh, limitations, one thing I realized is that the the politicians and the government should start just start. And they will see the limitation. Just, uh, I mean, just uh, same as I did, but from that point they can improve. So that was my learning. I wasn't really satisfied, uh, and I'm not satisfied because I'm now these days trying to convey this idea to Korea, and people are not listening, and people don't see this as a problem on top of this whole corona situation. But anyway, uh, when we talk about climate actions, like I think we cannot ask for a perfect plan. And uh, that was the case for us. We didn't have a perfect plan, but we just started at, at the very, very, from the scratch. And then you can build up from there. Uh, I don't know if, if my explanation was clear. Yeah, I think it was clear and I I can understand like because of climate change, like just about, for example, the selection of tree species, there are still uh, assumptions or some experiments maybe in, in the lab that, okay, maybe this tree species would be the best with regards to climate change, also some uncertainties. So yeah, I, I, I can understand. And also the, yeah, now that you have struggles setting up something similar in, in Korea. Mm -hmm. And how was it for you, Teresa? Was it, was it similar that you, after or in between, like you are still very involved that you, like, did it change somehow you as a person and what you think you can achieve? That's a difficult question. Um, to be honest, I think I just realized I should take some time to reflect on that question. <laughs> um, but my spontaneous answer on this would be, yeah, I think perhaps somehow it changed my personality a bit. Um, because never... Like, usually I'm more like a shy person, standing more in the background. And with the project, I was forced to, yeah, somehow stand in the forefront and talk to people. And so perhaps, yes, that somehow influenced me in, like, realizing I can do that. But I still don't like it. <laughs> but at least I know that I can do it, that I'm able to do that. Um, yeah, and like from a yeah professional point of view, let's say, like with regards to future career or yeah profession, I still like the academic work a lot. 
but perhaps I also realized that I really like project work, like working with different people, um, really doing something practical. And perhaps I will do both in the future, or perhaps it changes, like there will be a time when I do this more and then I will do more the practical stuff. But yeah, it's also possible to do both. Like you can, in your free time, you can do the practical work and setting up projects in your local hometown and you can still do academic research or stuff like that. Um, yeah, but I just, it just made me realize that I really enjoy the practical work and like seeing results. That's really nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool that, yeah. Yeah, I was just curious how Kuhn thinks about it. It's a really difficult question. Uh, I don't know <laughs> if it changes the personality, probably, but it's hard to hard to say it. I mean, for perhaps me, it's more easy for others to observe mm, it yeah, than yeah. observing your own. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was actually just uh, enjoying listening to Teresa's uh, reflection. And honestly, because I, I have a quite a uh, low expectation or let's say low self-estimation for me, for myself, uh, I can, I can hardly, hardly uh, remember a moment when I was delightful. Like, I think there were like few, few, few moments that I can recall. Like I was, I was happy, but like after just few, few, let's say minute, minutes and few hours, I was like, oh, again, concerning about like next steps and like, what can I improve? What can we improve? And what was, what didn't work? And yeah, all those things. So I don't know. I mean, it was really nice to, be able to, you know, make this forest, even though it's such a small area compared to the forests that that are burning. Uh, for me, because I, it was a, a, such a unique experience as an as a foreigner to be able to communicate. Let's say, even though I wasn't really communicating by myself, but I was able to convey my idea and. It seemed that even though I wasn't using the same language, they understood me, thanks to Teresa, of course. So I think like those moments uh, are uh, my rewards, not like after we got some awards or that mm -hmm. like some, some media coverage came out not those moments i think like the, the the very moments when we were talking with our stakeholders uh for example the stadt forest try uh mr dick mushig and mr uh, udo wenzel from elf Bayreuth. yeah people like these when when we were meeting them it was just so so nice to to be able to to share share our visions and find the common ground and build up the project together. Yeah, I totally agree with what Kuhn just said. And I think one more moment or moments when we realized what has happened was also when talking to our fellow students or friends, like when they just contacted us and told us, hey, it's just great what you did. Also you, Stefan, when we met with you, because as Kun said, Kun and me, we are both quite self-critical. And then when people just told us, hey, you you did such great things, then somehow we realize it. <laughs> um, yeah, and but I think the most or the best reward was just to see how the project got bigger and bigger and more and more people contacted us. And there are just like doors that kind of opened 
there were more more and more opportunities and people offered um like so many different things and everyone wanted to get involved somehow and that was just nice i think that was one of the best rewards we could ever got uh, get yeah so you mentioned um how much or yeah like in general like you really couldn't really like to the meetings with the partners and helping each other and Teresa you really liked when when others showed interest and wanted to join the project and I'm interested in are there maybe specific moments where you thought wow like where you really would from today would say this was a personal highlight for me was there a a meeting or a moment when you were in the forest that you would say wow this is so good i'm really happy that i'm doing this would you like to start kun if you if you can answer well i mean i don't think i can rank those moments but uh, to be fair to the participants uh i think we were so delighted when people actually showed up in the morning at the very first day uh, for the first planting event because even though some i mean i mean a lot of people uh they uh, reserved their seats seats i don't know places whatever they registered on the on the website yeah they registered they registered that they want to plant some trees because we had these shifts we had in total nine shifts for three days and yeah there were so many people who were interested in but still we were so uh worried that people simply uh, don't i mean wouldn't wouldn't show up and then at the at the first day they actually showed up and that was we were so thankful because people <laughs> showed up and from that point uh i think yeah okay We mm -hmm. were convinced that we can we can make it happen, and yeah, as time goes, uh, because usually the morning shift mm -hmm. were less people than uh, the afternoon shift. The more people showed up, and yeah, we got energy from them, and they were so motivated and asking questions. And you know, it was before Corona, so we were able to talk, and people could eat, drink, and everything. It was really nice. Yeah. I just wanted to stress here because to make everyone understand who's listening because Kun said oh it's just such a small area well it's it's one one hectare the area that was planted but it's not an like an industrial operation so it's just yeah like students developing this idea and then um im If you imagine you would be on your own, just like five people planting, you it would take weeks to plant them. So I think it's really uh, yeah amazing that so many people turned up. But yeah, how, how was it for you, Teresa? Is there a specific moment? <laughs> hmm. So yes, I definitely remember the moment that Kun just mentioned. Um, yeah, it's very nice memory. Um, perhaps another memory um, that I really remember is when when we had a meeting with our stakeholders in the forest side, the first planting side. And I still remember, I think, Kun, it was when you had your farewell just one month ago. And Mr. Gregor Aas and He's from the Botanical Garden and Dirk Muschik from the City Forestry Bayreuth. They just mentioned during our yeah, chat that they had an excursion with foresters from Franconia um, some weeks ago. And that was something where we as students were not involved, but just um, since they got to know each other, during the project, um, they just had a new kind of cooperation and just invited people and do this those excursions just on their own. 
and try to transfer the knowledge and um, yeah, help others, other foresters to yeah, set up those hopefully climate resilient forest sites. And yeah, I still remember that moment because I, I was like, wow, that's so great. Like perhaps or probably both of them, they didn't talk to each other before the entire project. So perhaps they didn't even know each other. And after our project and the initiation, they just like start excursions and information events on their own. And that was really nice to see and that they are so motivated and they just do it in their free time and yeah, try to convince other, others. That was really nice. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing for sharing these insights. I think it's really valuable and, and helpful to others. Because, yeah, like when you are developing a project or when you are doing something unpaid, I think it's it's so good really to to reflect about what you do and, and cherish those moments. Because in between, you are doing so many different things. You are studying. You maybe have a part-time job and you have this project and then it can be a struggle. And then if you have these moments, I think it really makes, yeah, makes it so worthwhile. Like besides the whole goal of making mm -hmm. forests more climate resilient, but also personally, personally, I think is this makes it really special. And yeah. Yeah, thanks, Stefan, for giving us the yeah, opportunity to reflect on those. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm I'm just yeah. glad that you are here and you <laughs> you agreed to be on the podcast. So I need to thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I would have a question to Kuhn actually, and um, because Kuhn, you mentioned that because Kuhn, you mentioned that you are trying to establish a similar project in South Korea at the moment, or at least to yeah somehow replace the current dominant tree species could you well, talk about that a bit more um, i'm interested in that i'm talking to people about Krima bird i mean the model that we made and i was i am actually observing the reactions because the whole climate issue is not as important as uh how how Germans are discussing. I mean, I, I know you might not be so satisfied with your situation, but compared to us, I think it's much better there. Um, so because we, let's say, do have a similar issue that in certain places, uh, the forests are uh, not so diverse. And even uh, to talk about this diversity issue is is not so easy because people simply uh, don't uh, agree with me. Uh, so I'm trying to find a way to be more, um, let's say, convincing. Because I, th I think it's a problem that people will not uh, agree with some some climate issues until they really see the damage. So I think in Germany, because you're seeing such a massive area of dying forest, like there's no one who would really argue about it. I mean, the, the problem of having this 50% of the whole forest uh, being composed of only two species. Mm. Uh, you're seeing it, so so no one will um, argue about it. But in Korea, we are at, not at that point. Uh, I think we have, let's say, a better, better composition, a bit better, because we don't have uh, a commercially valuable forests yet, and because of that, we didn't really manage that heavily. We didn't, we haven't changed the forest with the most uh, valuable tree species, unlike uh, Germany. So I'm now trying to like, you know, build up these uh, uh, stories like, and trying to 
uh, convey the, the importance of uh, having having diverse set of tree species, not only uh, composed of uh, native tree species, but also non-natives from southern parts because we are in a northern hemisphere and the uh, temperatures are rising uh, and, and the potential distribution of species are going northward. Uh, yeah, so it's not that I have a site and I uh, have these people like you and Greg Was, Dick Music, and Udo Wenze. It's just me and our designer, Aram, who are trying to share our experience that we had in Bayreuth. And, and so far, uh, the reactions are not so exciting. Do you think it there's still a a chance like maybe you if you find the right partners to to get something going because it would be really yeah kind of devastating if you need to have the visual impact of climate change on the forests with the uh, more frequent drought events then people just react like you say it's better here but i guess it's just like the the government and civil society and and people are reacting because they can see it but i guess this is too late right <laughs> so we we have a saying in korea uh that idiots repair their uh, farmhouse after uh, typhoon. Let's say I'm I'm translating it, not directly. So okay. I think we will only repair something or do something proactively once we see some kind of damage. I think that's in our nature. So I don't know really. Like like nowadays for the last few months and years, I, not years. Like I think it's. It feels like only it's been a like a year one when when this climate strike and Fridays for Future and everything started. Is it like more than one year? But anyway, so the younger generations are asking for more actions, but like uh, these old people are, it feels like they are waiting for more, more visual clues and and you're so right it's gonna be too late once we see those clues yeah this is one of the biggest challenges of climate change i think like usually people need to see to see it um yeah to act to realize about the risk and then they start acting but as you said Stefan. Um, it's too late for climate change or with regards to climate change because once we see it we reach the tipping points so this logic doesn't work for climate change start acting when you see things it doesn't work because then it's too late and then we already have passed some tipping points and then it's irreversible so that's a really huge problematic yes so therefore start acting now <laughs> as we said you can just start you you learn so much and you know much more than you um than you are even aware of and everyone can just start something even if it's if it's just a little thing it might turn into something bigger and then it's yeah it can really help yeah maintaining a future living for it is also not too bad if you have a really great idea and you try your best and it does not work like there's this word and sometimes there are these events called happy fail where you are also acknowledging that not everything is going perfect mm -hmm. like also phd students and researchers sharing how many times they failed or yeah people who apply for for funding for their project it does not always work and <laughs> And it's okay, like <clears throat> you still you still learn a lot and and you will improve. But I think it's important to 
yeah stay consistent yeah. if you know what like so even like you said Teresa, even something small if you know that this will improve the future this will improve the situation for everyone then yeah stay at it and stay consistent and trying to make it work yeah because this argumentation of ah, i can cannot do anything and uh, i'm just one single person um, first the others should start doing something that doesn't work because if everyone just yeah yeah transfers the responsibility to others then in the end no one starts and yeah it's it's too late to wait any longer everyone just has to start <laughs> even like if it's on the local scale or individual scale or national or international level i think we really have to address all levels and act on all levels yes and just a short um question to kun what you said before because i when you mentioned this saying i thought there was something coming like you said like idiots repair their house or their farm after a typhoon and then i thought okay hmm, 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 i'm more proactive or something like that like was that the whole saying or is there something to it it was the whole saying i mean yeah so your friends will told tell you about it <laughs> uh when you're trying to study one day before your uh exam so like yeah that you're not being proactive and you're not being so uh <laughs> prepared yeah okay <laughs> perhaps i have a more or perhaps i have a quote that i would like to add as well uh, i just yeah it just came to my mind um, so I think there was, I think he was the first Czech president. I think his name is uh, Mr. Havel or so. But like the main thing is he said that hope does not mean optimism. So it's not the, um, it's not being convinced that something turns out good in the end, but it's the rather the certainty that something makes sense no matter how it ends like if it will be positive in the um, in the end but as long as you know that something makes sense just start and yeah stay stay hopeful <laughs> yeah yeah had such a nice quote thank you for sharing teresa Yeah, like sometimes when I when I tell people about the podcast, then I I think I feel like I need to justify because um is it still okay to be hopeful or is this already too positive? But then I say like it does not mean I think everything will be great and I can just stop worrying. It just means that there's I I want to stay hopeful and do something to yeah like for my time now for our time now we can still do as much as we can do today we cannot change the past and maybe we will not change the world but we can contribute to it and this also relates to one of the last questions for today um yeah maybe you you want to start kun My question is, where do you find hope? I mean, or what gives you hope? Before you ask me uh, to to be on this podcast, I was so worried because I'm really not an optimistic person, and this is such a hard question. I don't want to lie. These days, ah, uh, it's really hard to find hope. Yeah, it's really hard to find hope. So, for example, three days ago on Saturday, I had this small uh, online meeting to talk about car-free cities in Korea. It's not that we have car-free cities, but we were um, talking, I mean, we were discussing if 
we can potentially um, implement some ideas from that concept for car-free cities. Basically, reduce cars, uh, more public transportation, more room for work uh, uh, pedestrians and you know bikers and things like that. And we had 60 people, uh, which was nice because 60 people showed up. But so let's say hope part is, the, is uh, that number, 60. But when there's a hope, I mean, at least for me, there's always this, uh, I don't know, bitterness or uh, depressing realization of uh, of being so small. Like I, I told you that the forest was too small compared to the area of forest that burnt this year, let's say. So 60 people was large enough to, to be really, you know, uh, motivated and discuss about the car-free cities and, you know, learn something new. But at the same time, we know, because in Korea, there are 50 million people who we, maybe half of them should be convinced to, to make, uh, not half, let's say, let's say even 10%, it, it's such a, a lot of people that we are living together and it's for me it's always a very small fraction of powerless people who show up so yeah there's a hope even the powerless people don't give up that's that's amazing but i think this hope is not only hope it's it always goes to this bitterness that I taste. So uh, sorry, this is not a good answer. Like I cannot really talk about hope. No, that's like a perfect answer. Like, of course, um, yeah, the, the podcast is called Stories of Climate Change Hope, but you can also say if you're not hopeful, I mean, and you said you're kind of in between, like you really... You found it really good that 60 people show up, showed up for your event on, on Car Free Cities, but you yeah, you are not sure about what it will change because maybe their, their role in society, they are not in a powerful position. Yeah, a couple of months ago, I read a book about which took account and described some of the successes of um, social movements in the last century and also in the, in the last few years. And then, you know, like some of these movements started really small with only a few people. And if you look back to what they have achieved, like they have completely changed some of the societies. And that after that, like reading that book, and also some some other things at that time, but it really made made clear to me that you know these things they they can really lead to a change. It is maybe not the change that comes from the government directly, but the government and the law is maybe reacting actually, so not proactive, but reacting to these movements and to these developments inside the society. So that's why I, what you described, I think it's, for me, it is really helpful. I mean, yeah, 60 people showed up for probably an online event. <laughs> yeah. What about yeah. you, Teresa? Is it similar for you or do you, can you find hope? <laughs> Yeah, to be honest, it's a really difficult question and I really had to think about it, but I agree with both of you. So, um, yeah, sometimes there, or most of the time, I'm also, I, I personal, personally feel, yeah, 
very like little and weak and like seeing all the problems ongoing at the moment. But yeah, as you said, Stefan, I um, think there are also those kind of tipping points in social conventions. So I think it's like like two years ago or so there was an article in Science uh, investigating the uh, empirical evidence for those tipping points in society and I think they said it's like 20 uh, or 25 percent of the yeah population that needs needs to be convinced um, and then something will happen and yeah as you said I think in the past we've seen that if problems are taking serious um, like also with regards to corona or also like for example the example of the ozone layer like if people are really convinced that it's a problem and then something can happen so quickly and people just start acting and then yeah it might prevent the yeah catastrophe so i think that gives me hope that um, it doesn't not not everyone needs to be convinced um, but it's like the yeah the movement is growing and perhaps sometimes or one day hopefully soon we will reach the critical point so that something happens and yeah that we can make a lot of pressure <laughs> um, on the politicians and yeah decision makers to act and what helps me as well is yeah surrounding myself with people who are yeah doing something and who are really trying every day and fight so hard that something is happening and that really helps me like to see that there are many people fighting for a better world and that really helps me um yeah still perhaps still believing in hope <laughs> but yeah thank you <laughs> Yeah, if we have time, maybe a few more minutes, then I would come yeah, to fine. the last question, which is more, it can be about anything. The question is, the question is, what, what are you looking forward doing in the next days or next two weeks? Can be personal, can be study related. Like now, it, today is the 22nd of December. So in a few days, it's Christmas. Maybe you'll look yeah or yeah um, <laughs> sorry <laughs> just go ahead would you start so, kun i actually got a piece of stolen from adam's co-worker so i think i'll enjoy that sorry what did you get a piece of so the bread the, the german ah, bread. ah okay stolen. okay yeah stolen yeah ah. yeah yeah, yeah. So they are selling it in even in Korea, and then they usually uh, <laughs> sell it during this uh, time, the Christmas time. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to having it, maybe with some glue wine, because I was really? able to bring <laughs> one uh, bottle of glue wine uh, Enjoy back, to, it. back to Korea. So yeah, that that would be yeah, that would be lovely. Please share a photo with mm -hmm. um with us, Kun, and then, you and yeah. Adam. <laughs> I would love to see that. Sure, <laughs> sure, I'll do. I'll do so. And I, actually, I just remembered. So on the twenty first, uh, fourth, the the Christmas Eve, uh, there's this uh, small environmental group uh, who are who is going to screen uh, a documentary called "This Will Change Everything." So it's originally a book written by Naomi Klein. And yeah, they they was they they were very nice to to make it uh, freely available for one hundred people who register. So I was able to register. So I think I can watch that with Ara with a nice uh, cup of glue wine and the stolen. That's nice. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. Oh. Yeah. What about you, Teresa? 
yeah, I'm looking forward to spend some time with my family and friends um, back home because I, yeah, I don't see them so often, also this year, especially due to Corona. So yeah, I'm looking forward to spend some time with my yeah family and friends. Um, and also perhaps thanks to the podcast today, I'm looking forward to reflect on what has happened this year and take some time um, yeah, to calm down and just reflect what has happened and also to make perhaps some plans for the new year and yeah, for my future in general. Yeah, I'm looking forward just for some calm and relaxed days. Yeah. How about you, Stefan? Oh, <laughs> I'm also curious about your yeah your plan. It, <laughs> it's the first time someone asked me this actually. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah, the same for you. me. I think for Kun as well. <laughs> Yeah. Um <laughs> yeah, it's not so easy. Your I mean <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> next week, well of course, yeah. <laughs> I hope I will get into the Christmas spirit, being more relaxed like the next two three days. So I'm not going home. Um we will have like a virtual Christmas. Um so just like the video call. And I really hope that it will somehow be at least have the same same atmosphere, although we can be in the same room, not in the same place. Yeah. And then another thing is that <laughs> you already mentioned Nikun Spatak. Um, next week, I will have a conversation with him and another friend, Ori Leonga, um, for the podcast. And this will be about... Yeah, like how how writing can, yeah, can help us reflect and can help us to, yeah, maybe develop projects and also write stories that can be shared with others to, yeah, not just share some some facts like about the Klimawald project or climate action, but also share share our stories and share some fiction that might also be really interesting for people to just listen to or read. Oh, that's so cool. Cool. Yeah, so thank you so much, Teresa and Kun. Thank you so much for agreeing to be here today and yeah, sharing your insights into the project and also sharing your yeah, your reflections on it and how how it even helped you develop and yeah. So thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks to you. Yeah, it was nice to talk to you. Before we really finally end with this episode, I would like to read out the poem that Teresa mentioned. The poem by Václav Havel is called Hope. Either we have hope within us or we do not. It is a dimension of the soul and is not essentially dependent on some particular observation of the world. Hope is an orientation of the spirit, an orientation of the heart. It transcends the world that is immediately experienced and is anchored somewhere beyond its horizons. Hope in this deep and powerful sense is not the same as joy that things are going well or willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for early success, but rather an ability to work for something because it is good, not because it stands a chance to succeed. Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. It is hope, above all, which gives the strength to live and continually try new things. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.
Thanks goes to Coco for the creative support and the logo design. And also thanks to Vulcan Recorder for the music contribution. You can listen to the podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio and all other podcast distribution apps on your phone. The next episode will be released in one week or two weeks. Thank you for listening and make sure to tune in next time. Bye bye.